What really happened in episode 1 of season 8 of Game of Thrones? What did we learn, and what hints did we get about how this will all end? Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. If you want regular insight and intelligent debate about Game of Thrones and more, then click on the subscribe button in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. So it's finally here. Episode 1 of Season 8 of Game of Thrones. This was very much a setup episode, getting all the pieces into place in time for the last five episodes. The plot doesn't move forwards hugely, but there are a lot of hints about how it is all going to end. The show opens at Winterfell, but let's actually start down south at King's Landing. We see Euron arriving with the Golden Company. 20,000 men, horses, and no elephants. It's a shame about the elephants. Cersei seems disappointed that they have none, but I don't think it will affect the story much going forwards. In the books, the Golden Company has a lot of backstory. They were actively involved in previous Targaryen civil wars, and in the books are actively involved in a completely different invasion of Westeros, with a character who doesn't appear on the show. I think it's clear, though, that on the show, they're going to be treated as just another sellsword company, albeit in cool-looking golden armour. What is more important is the strengthened alliance between Cersei and Euron. While Jaime was at her side, Cersei seemed to be in a very powerful position here, but Euron was right that he has done all that was asked of him. Their alliance is sealed in the bedroom, But this is far from a stable alliance. Both think that they are playing each other. He talks of putting a child in her belly, and she smiles or grimaces, clearly hinting at the pregnancy that she effectively told Tyrion about last season, but she carries on drinking anyway. She doesn't seem to be showing many signs of it yet, but, well, let's see how that one plays out. The larger point here is that both Cersei and Euron in their own ways confirm that their plans are unchanged from last season. Cersei is pleased when Kyburn tells her that the Night's King has broken through the wall. This confirms that her plan is that she will let the two armies in the north fight each other, and then take on whoever survives that, thinking that they will be weaker. It's a sensible if Machiavellian plan on the face of it, but ignores the fact that if the army of the dead win, then they will be stronger, not weaker, boosted by the fallen dead of their vanquished foes. As usual, it's clear that Cersei's strategy is not quite as clever as she thinks it is. Euron also confirms to Yara that he is just using Cersei, for sex it would appear, Once he is done with her, and if the White Walkers appear to be winning, then he will just sail somewhere else. While all this is going on, Theon rescues Yara, who Euron has kept tied up on his ship for the journey to and from Essos. Theon's rescue of her is a callback and reversal of when Yara attempted to rescue Theon several seasons ago. Then he was deeply under Ramsay's control and pushed her away. This time, she punches him, but ultimately accepts his help. It's one of many callbacks to earlier seasons in this episode. The upshot is that Theon decides to head up to Winterfell to help the Starks, and she decides to go back to the Iron Islands to retake what she believes is rightfully hers. She justifies it by saying that perhaps Danny might need somewhere to go if Winterfell falls. This is looking forward quite a bit, but perhaps the next time we see Yara is whenever someone does head over to there. Perhaps it will even be Euron when he has decided that Cersei is a losing bet. If so, Yara will be waiting for him. His comeuppance will surely come not from some random northerner or Targaryen who don't have much of a grudge against him, but from Yara and Theon who do. The other thing that happened in the south is that Bronn got hired again by Cersei this time. Or at least commissioned and given some money, because we don't actually see him say yes. Cersei wants him to kill Jaime and Tyrion using a crossbow. It looks like Joffrey's crossbow, and is a deliberate throwback to how Tyrion killed their father, having been freed from prison by Jaime. 
So, over the course of eight seasons, Bronn has now been hired by all three Lannister siblings. His amusement and incredulity is understandable. Will he go through with it? I actually suspect not. There will be some tension. I imagine that at some point we will see him confront one or both of Tyrion and Jaime, but ultimately Cersei has probably miscalculated again, giving him money up front and sending him to someone who has promised to double anything he has paid elsewhere. But let's turn to Winterfell. We pick up the story as we imagined we would, with Jon's return with Danny, her army, and two dragons. Their arrival is a strong callback to episode one of season one of Game of Thrones, when King Robert Baratheon came to visit Ned Stark and all the other Starks when they were much younger. That time, Arya didn't want to be part of the lineup, so climbed up something so she could see the soldiers as they passed. This time, again, she goes missing, incognito in the crowd, and we see a small boy doing what she did all those years ago climbing up to see over the shoulders of the gathered small folk. Nevertheless, Danny does get a welcoming committee, with Sansa, Bran and their new retinue. And Sansa uses the same words her father used to greet King Robert. Winterfell is yours, your grace. The history here is heavy. Sansa's father last used those words to the man who killed Danny's brother, and Danny's father, in turn, had killed Ned's father and brother. Starks and Targaryens don't have an easy history. At which point, of course, we become painfully aware of the political tensions that are simmering just under the surface at Winterfell. The Northern Lords aren't happy, and understandably so, because they made it very clear to Jon that they didn't want him bending the knee to a Targaryen. Lyanna Mormont voices her concerns, and the Glovers appear to have given up on the idea of joining the others at Winterfell completely in protest, although why they think that the wooden Motton Bailey castle at Deepwood Mott would provide better protection than Winterfell's tall stone walls is anyone's guess. More immediate are the familial tensions amongst the Starks. Sansa's pointed question to Jon about whether he bent the knee to save the North or because he loved Danny sounds harsh, but it's also pretty fair. Danny had committed to fighting with him against the White Walkers before he bent the knee. He didn't need to do that in order to gain her support, her armies and her dragons. And Sansa is also right to point out that two armies and two dragons will use up a lot of the supplies she spent most of last season amassing. But to be honest, these disagreements are all largely set dressing at this point. Yes, the tensions are rightfully there, and yes, the concerns are real, but once the army of the dead arrives, these domestic matters of who rules who will feel largely irrelevant in the face of an existential threat. And Sansa has clearly been preparing for that. She's called the banners to Winterfell. All the Northern Lords have been instructed to bring their people there, so Winterfell is being treated as the last best hope. This is a reasonable decision. It is a strong castle, and making the Night King come to you where you are strongest, and combining all your forces there, is a sensible move. Sending little Ned Umber back to the last hearth when the army of the dead is descending on it, on the other hand, well, we'll come back to that in a moment. Let's get on to the reunions, because this episode is really all about those reunions. Arya has three, for example. Her one with Sandor Clegane is underplayed, in my view. They spent a lot of time together, and formed quite a bond in a kind of odd couple way back in seasons three and four, and when she last saw him, it was quite the pivotal moment for both of them. Sandor had fought Brienne, and Brienne had won, leaving Sandor mortally wounded, or so Arya thought. He told her to kill him, and free him from his pain, but she couldn't bring herself to do it, and instead headed off to find a ship to Bravos. So he lived, and she lived, and both are very different people now. Her reunion with John has been brewing ever since episode two of the first season. They had a strong bond as children, and John gave her needle when she headed down to Winterfell. He asks to see it and shows her his sword, and they both hint at quite how different they are now. 
but what is more revealing here are the revelations about their respective motivations. They both say that they are about protecting House Stark. John's loyalties that way will, of course, be tested by revelations later in the episode. Arya's reunion with Gendry is a lot more positive, flirtatious even. The takeaway point is that she has ordered a bespoke weapon, a staff of some kind with dragonglass blade or blades. It's noteworthy because she'll surely be using that later in the season when the army of the dead arrive. But what I found more interesting is the fact that the writing in this episode has pushed us strongly to a new understanding of Arya returning to be herself. It's hard to imagine faceless woman Arya from a season or two ago flirting or getting so emotional about seeing someone, but here she is. She seems to have pulled herself right through to the other side and is returning to something closer to normal. Sansa and Tyrion's reunion, on the other hand, is set up as a role reversal of who they were when they were last together. When they were married in King's Landing, it was she who was naive, and he was the politically astute, powerful one. Now the situation is deliberately reversed. He displays confidence that Cersei will send the army north that she promised, and Sansa effectively scoffs at his naivety. I have many thoughts about Tyrion's shift from always being the cleverest person in the room to strategic numpty over the last couple of seasons, but they're probably best left to another video. For now, though, it's worth noting how Sansa says that she used to think that Tyrion was the cleverest man alive, but now he's obviously not, and how Jon says that Sansa now thinks that she is smarter than everyone. Is this teeing up a moment when it becomes apparent that Sansa isn't that smart either? Perhaps. Game of Thrones is a show that doesn't tend to reward characters who think too highly of themselves. One other reunion is worth noting, Jamie and Bran. We didn't see it play out fully, but Jamie, arriving incognito, sees Bran and recognises him. Last time he saw him, he pushed him out of a window and tried to kill him. Bran's reaction will presumably be shown next time, but I think we can guess. Bran, let's be clear about this, no longer exists. He is now the Three-Eyed Raven. Last season, Bran admitted to Mira that he wasn't really Bran anymore. He remembers being Bran, but isn't actually still him, so any feelings he has about his attempted murder will be objective, not personal. And objectively, he will probably recognise that Jamie pushing him out of a window was necessary for him to become what he is now. Bran was supposed to go to King's Landing, but didn't, and his coma allowed Bloodraven to contact him, leading to his journey north, and so on. Bran probably thinks that Jaime, unintentionally, did the right thing, or more precisely, the necessary thing. He won't feel the need for vengeance. Indeed, it's noticeable that in this episode, despite Sansa's organising of logistics, Danny's rulership and Jon's big reveal at the end of the episode, the person directing events is Bran. It is he who stops the social niceties early on to move people on to discuss how to face up to the army of the dead. It is he who is in just the right place to meet Jaime on his arrival, surely bringing forward the meeting to decide his fate and the truth coming out about Cersei's betrayal. And it is Bran who is in place to tell Sam to tell Jon about his true parentage. Now is the time, he says. He clearly knows what he wants to happen and when, and is gently nudging things along. We should spare a moment for Sam at this point, because the right time, according to Bran, is just after Sam has been told by Danny that she killed his father and brother. He is understandably upset, even though his relationship with his father was a long way from being a good one, to put it mildly. But if Bran was wanting Sam to tell John the truth, because John will always believe Sam, then that was definitely the right time to push him to do it, because although Sam probably didn't originally see the urgency in telling John about his true parents, now he undoubtedly sees the advantage in it. He immediately sees John as a better prospect for Monarch than the woman who just admitted to killing his family. It's clear from what Sam says that he thinks that John is better than that, is better than Danny. 
and should definitely press his claim to be king over her. Sam may be passing on the message, but it is Bran again pulling the strings. We don't see all of Jon's reaction here to the news, but there is some clear cognitive dissonance going on. He is standing in front of Ned Stark's statue being told that Ned isn't his father, and although he effectively quit as King of the North, he's actually the rightful king of the whole Seven Kingdoms. One of the biggest plot points for the next episode will be how Jon reacts to this news, and who else gets to find out. Perhaps he could have guessed a bit about his Targaryen heritage, given how easily he takes to riding Rhaegal. Dragon riding is, historically, almost always reserved for those with Valyrian heritage, which Starks definitely don't have, but he takes it all in his stride nonetheless. There's an interesting callback here, incidentally, in how Danny suggests that the two of them could just stay forever in that remote hideaway they find. Egret, John's wildling lover from a few seasons ago, suggested the same thing to him in that cave, where they consummated their relationship north of the Wall. This very conscious drawing of a parallel between Danny and Egret is intriguing, because the parallels are already there. For example, she was said to have been kissed by fire, and Danny is more than kissed by fire. Was Egret's fate a foreshadowing of Danny's? It's possible. We'll have to wait and see. Aside from all this, and apparently ignorant of it all, Danny and John's effective small council of old men, Varys, Davos and Tyrion, seem to have come to the conclusion that the best long-term solution to all this is a marriage. It's Davos's idea, and one suspects that Danny probably wouldn't be too averse to it all even after she's discovered that John is her nephew. She grew up believing that she would probably marry her brother, after all. In any event, it's one of the options on the table for after the Night King has been dealt with. Davos, Tyrion and Varys are not really fighters, so their role in the defence of Winterfell will be limited. This is just the start of their behind-the-scenes politicking, I suspect. But despite the revelation of Jon's heritage and the long-awaited Jamie bran confrontation, the real heart of this episode is what happened at the last hearth. Beric and Tormund and some others, fresh from the destruction of Eastwatch, are heading south, and they meet Ed and what appears to be whatever remains of the Night's Watch from Castle Black. They are both en route to Winterfell and came across the last hearth, home of House Umber. This is where young Ned Umber went back to to fetch his family and army. It's fair to say that that order was a miscalculation by Sansa. The army of the dead moved faster than she was expecting, and Ned Umber didn't stand much of a chance. And in an echo of the very first scene of the very first episode of Game of Thrones, Tormund, Beric and Ed are expecting to see bodies amidst the devastation, and there are none. The Umbers have clearly been killed and raised as whites. And again, the White Walkers have left a symbol for people to find, something that is clearly important to them and to the denouement of this story. I will go into this in full detail in another video later this week, but the two key points here are these. First, this is the sign that they have left before with dead bodies. A symbol that is a deliberate harking back to the place of their creation. This is what motivates them, and what they want people to know. They are here for revenge for their very existence. It's true that this does look a little bit like the Targaryen sigil as well, if you squint a bit. If that's deliberate, then that has some quite far-reaching implications. But the more important thing is the Weirwood symbolism here. The White Walkers are recreating the pattern of the standing stones around the Weirwood tree at the place where they were created. The second really important point is that what happens here is quite possibly foreshadowing of how all this might end. Beric kills the awakened white Ned Umber by thrusting his flaming sword into him. This sets fire to all of the pattern of dead bodies. It's deliberate imagery on the showrunner's part. Fire doesn't naturally do that. Transposing this across to what it is very clearly symbolising, this is the burning of the weirwood that was at the heart of the White Walker's creation, the destruction of the magic that created them. Beric is used symbolically as an analogue for John. 
George R. R. Martin has admitted as much. He was brought back to life by a red priest. He is dedicated to fighting against the army of the dead. He has lost his love of life and is carrying on largely through duty. He has a flaming sword, as Melisandre clearly thinks John, as she thinks the prince that was promised should have, and so on. If I had to guess, I would say that this is symbolically showing us how the White Walkers must end by striking with a flaming magic sword at the heart of the tree or magic that created the Night King in the first place. As I said, I'll explain more of this thinking in a video later this week. Please join me for live streams on Thursdays and Sundays all through the season, where I'll be discussing all the points raised in this episode with special guests and making predictions about future episodes. If you'd like to see more of my Game of Thrones Season 8 videos, please click on this link on the left of the screen. Or if you'd like to support the channel, or get some exclusive content or priority access on my live streams, please click on the link to my Patreon page on the right of the screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again soon.